seriously, I want you to make it loud for my very good friend, Jared Kasselbach! <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. Are we having a good night so far? We're having so much fun. I, uh, I'm originally from Indiana, you know, but I live in Los Angeles now. I tell all my friends in Indiana that the big difference between Los Angeles and Indiana is that in Los Angeles, I've actually used the sentence, oh yeah, I know a pretty good parking lot near there. We have to say that. They're like, yeah, I'm going to the game downtown. I'm like, you will not believe the hookup I have on a good lot right there, okay? In Indiana, if you say the good book, you can pretty safely assume people are talking about the Bible, right? But in Los Angeles, if you say the good book, people are like, Michelle Obama's book was great, you know? <laughs> That's how it feels. Uh, my name is Jared, right? Uh, whenever I tell people my name is Jared, they're always like, oh, like the subway guy? <laughs> can we stop that, guys? I don't know if y'all know, but that dude's in federal prison, okay? <laughs> That guy's been in federal prison for eight years now, okay? So we in the community of Jared's would appreciate literally any other Jared at this point, okay? There's gotta be a better Jared, okay? One time I said that though, and somebody in the audience shouted out and they were like, yeah, like Jared Leto. And then somebody else was like, he's not that much better. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of Jared Leto, but if you think Jared Leto is not that much better than Jared Fogel from Subway, I don't think you know why Jared Fogel from Subway is in federal prison, okay? That dude's locked up for a long time. One of them you don't like is acting. The other one is in federal prison, okay? It's a pretty big difference. If you don't know what Jared Fogel did, right, all I'll say is that the FBI raided his basement and confiscated a bunch of hard drives, okay, right? I don't usually like to say the crime on stage, but it rhymes with mild cartography, okay? <laughs> So literally at this point, any other Jared I think is better, right? Do you guys have the gallery of jewelry here? Yeah? Yeah, I'm just pitching Jareds, okay? I'm just trying to give you more Jareds. So you have a, a Jared in your cap that you can pull out when you meet a Jared, right? Because you wouldn't walk up to a Jeffrey and be like, oh, Jeffrey, like Jeffrey Epstein. You just wouldn't do that, right? But it's the same crime at the end of the day. But when you think about it, what's a bummer is that's pretty much all the Jareds. All the famous ones, that's it. You can probably think of one more, Kushner, but we're not going there right now, okay? And then there's me. I'm trying to be that Jared, you know? I'm trying to be that better Jared for the other Jareds out there. So that when you meet a Jared, you can be like, oh, Jared, like from the White Rabbit. <laughs> you know? People are gonna be like, what does that mean? What does that mean? Is that a place with just a white rabbit around a black background? Like, yeah. Yeah, but it's a great club. <laughs> it is. Man, I, uh, I got TSA pre-check. Anybody else out there got TSA pre-check? Yeah? Got a couple pre-checkers out in the audience. I like that. If you don't know TSA pre-check, right, helps you go through the TSA line in the airport faster. TSA pre-check is probably the only time in my life that I actually feel confident that I'm better than other people. You know? I walk through that TSA pre-check line, I look at the normal TSA people next to me, and all of a sudden I'm like, who are these peasants right here, you know? Like, do they even have a bank account, right? They probably watch Hulu with ads. Like, that's how it feels, you know? I try to be a pretty humble guy, but if I've walked through that TSA pre-check line recently, all of a sudden I'm like, you know, I think I get why they believed in the divine right of kings in the Middle Ages, you know? Like, God did make me different. That's how it feels right here, right? I become that guy who's like, do you know who my father is, <laughs> you know? If you don't know, TSA pre-check is a wild idea, right? You meet with a federal agent once, you pay $100, and then for the next five years, they're pretty sure you're not a terrorist. <laughs> That's amazing. You get a Disneyland Fast Pass at the airport for five years, okay? You don't have to take your shoes off, you don't have to take your laptop out of your bag, and you get to look down on other people, okay? That's what I'm paying for. If I had TSA pre-check confidence in high school, there'd be no ladies left in that high school, okay? But instead, I didn't have TSA pre-check in high school, and I had my first kiss at 21, okay? And I got rejected to prom, so... I don't need your pity, but thank you. I appreciate it. I'm doing all right now, but thank you. I appreciate that. 
I'm just trying to provide a vivid picture for you all here so you understand the stakes that, that, are, that you're at uh, surrounding getting TSA pre-check, okay? I'm actually just a TSA agent and our numbers are down, please. Please sign up, okay? I get a commission. Indianapolis is where we need sign-ups right now. Okay. Take your shoes off. Sorry, it just comes out of me sometimes. Sorry. Man, I, I've never felt less safe at an airport or on an airplane than directly after getting TSA pre-check. You know, when you realize how easy the process is. I met with the federal agent. We started talking. They asked me what I did. We talked about to stand up for like a half hour. That's all I wanted to talk about. I'm like, don't you have a job to do right now? Aren't you supposed to ask me if I'm into pyrotechnics or something like that? I'm not even confident I don't have a shoe bomb right now. Like, that's how it felt. Right? And then he asked me, like, when's the next time you're going to be in town for a show? And let me let you guys in on a secret. He did not come, okay? <laughs> He's a terrible TSA agent. Are you guys terrorists? <laughs> How would I know if you haven't met with a federal agent in the last five years? I don't know. That's the only way I can figure it out. I, uh... I was back in Indiana a few months ago and I was doing a bunch of shows and I texted a buddy of mine and I was like, hey, I've got a bunch of shows this weekend. You should come see me perform, right? He texted me back. He had seen me perform like a long time ago back when I started. And he texted me back and he just goes, oh, have you improved? <laughs> and we don't talk anymore. I don't hit him up. He wasn't on the list for tonight. He wasn't. I didn't want that energy in here, you know? He recently got married. I didn't go. I, uh, I wasn't invited, but I didn't go. <laughs> At the end of the day, you could tell we weren't actually that close, I think. I, uh, I was shopping at a Trader Joe's recently, and a man came up to me in the parking lot, and, and he was begging for food. And I was like, oh, yeah, it'll be nice. Like, what can I get for you, man, you know? And he goes, well, actually, I'm vegan. <laughs> so maybe some vegan sushi, that's what he said. And I was like, wait a second. I know they say beggars can't be choosers, but I don't think they can be vegan either, okay? <laughs> I, uh, I saw a food recently advertised as 100% gluten-free. You guys seen that before? 100% gluten-free? You've seen gluten-free, but have you seen 100% <laughs> gluten-free used as a marketing technique on the packaging? Okay. Can we agree that if something is 90% gluten-free, there's gluten in there, guys, okay? <laughs> you don't need the percentage in front of it, okay? If something is 90% vegan, you're eating a dead animal, okay? <laughs> That's how that works. If you tell your girlfriend I 90% love you, you're single now, okay? <laughs> Not everything needs a percentage in front of it, okay? I, uh, I want to make a Netflix show just called Straight Eye. <laughs> but it'd be me every episode going, I thought that looked pretty good already. <laughs> be the whole thing. Be five-minute episodes. They'd be like, look at this guy's life. And I'd be like... Pretty good, pretty good, <laughs> pretty good. But dumb, that's the Netflix logo. That's it, five minute episodes right there. I'm pitching it to Netflix next week. Uh, you guys know that moving company, Two Men and a Truck? They have that here, right? Two Men and a Truck? I don't know if you guys know, but they're a pretty big company these days. I think they need to change their name, okay? To Two Men and a Truck and a bunch of other men and a bunch of other trucks. <laughs> and a corporate office in Lansing, Michigan, okay? <laughs> I like that one because it shows I Googled where the corporate offices are. <laughs> They're in Lansing. Yeah, I'm doing edgy stuff, I know. <laughs> Cancel culture's tough out there, but I'm talking about two men in a truck moving company. That's really where the line's drawn these days. <laughs> I, uh, I was at a restaurant recently that I saw it had a burger on its menu that said it came with both avocado and guacamole. <laughs> which feels pretty redundant, right? Okay, that's like saying I'll take the potatoes sliced and mashed, you know what I mean? It's the same thing, just two different ways of saying it, you know? It's like saying I want to take an Uber and talk to somebody I don't know, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's the same thing, just two different ways of saying it, right? It's like saying I want to kill two birds with one stone and kill that bird with this stone and that bird with this stone, you know? It's the same thing, just two different ways of saying it. It's like saying I'm a cat person. I also don't have a lot of friends. Same thing. <laughs> Just two different ways of saying it at the end of the day, right? Do you guys realize they took the word snake and changed it to essential and people started buying the oils again? <laughs> you guys thought about that much? 
I think about that like once a week, you guys, okay? I know I'm in the Midwest. I know I'm in Indiana. I know this is a big essential oils territory. I get it. What are we rubbing on ourselves? Doterra, Young Living. What are we using out there, guys? You know, a little eucalyptus before bed, a little peppermint oil, no? Don't pull away. We got distributors out there. Come on, okay? <laughs> Statistically, you're out there. I know you are. Um, do you guys know why they call them essential and essential oils? Does anybody know? Essential and essential oils? You might be thinking it means it's necessary, right? That's the main use of the word essential in the English language, right? But this is where they got us, because that's not what it means in essential oils. In essential oils, it means it's of the essence of the plant that they're talking about. So it's essential in that way. It's of the essence. So essential eucalyptus oil is essentially eucalyptus oil. <laughs> wow, they figured it out, guys. They figured out the rebrand. They swindled us good, you know? They pulled the wool right over our eyes. The essential wool right over our eyes. They took a word that means I need it, and they changed it to super small part of, right? <laughs> That's like if I was like, here's an essential rock. It's just a pebble. That's all it is. <laughs> I'm like, rub that on your neck before you go to bed. <laughs> I'll end the TED Talk in a second, but I don't know if you guys know... Uh, essential oils are almost always multi-level marketing campaigns, right? Almost always. Deuterra, Young Living, almost always multi-level marketing. But all multi-level marketing campaigns in America, nationally, the national statistic is that less than 1% of participants in multi-level marketing campaigns make money, okay? That's an actual national statistic, less than 1%. So the next time somebody slides in your Facebook Messenger DMs, right, and it's like, hey, bestie, are you making as much money as you want to be right now? I've, got, I've gotten those, okay? You can just say, yeah. <laughs> and be done. You don't got to let them buy you dinner first, okay? You can say goodbye to Cutco Kelly from high school and move on, you know? I've been thinking a lot, it feels like the world's kind of ending, right? Do we all agree on that? Kind of starts to feel like the world's ending. We're seeing a lot of media about the world's ending, Last of Us and stuff. But I've been thinking about job security as a comedian in the face of a post-apocalyptic society and realizing that the one skill that I've nurtured for the last eight years probably isn't gonna matter, you know? <laughs> probably not the best skill I should have really doubled down on, I think. We're gonna go back to like a bartering society and somebody's gonna be like, what can you give me for these 12 eggs? And I'd be like, do you remember TSA pre-check? <laughs> they just shoot me right there. That's the end. That's the end, right? Because in a hunter-gatherer society, that, those are the two jobs. That's it. You can't add another one to that. And like in a quiet place, can you imagine a comedian in a quiet place? Not like, <laughs> not like a, an actor that is a comedian, but like the role in that society as a comedian. I'd be like, why are all these aliens killing us about noise? And then I'd die. That's it. <laughs> Seinfeld in A Quiet Place 3. That's actually true. <laughs> true quick <laughs> update for you. I, uh, I like to bicycle. Any of you guys like to bicycle? I like to bicycle a lot. There's a bike lane near my, near my place in Los Angeles, and I, and I like to bicycle quite a bit. My biggest pet peeve on a bicycle, right, is when people walk in the bike lane. Do you guys understand this? I become that guy, right? Especially when there's a, a sidewalk for walking next to the bike lane, right? But people still choose to walk on the bike path. I become my, like my old grandpa who's like, this would be a good place for a bike path. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I become that guy, like I hate it. It's the most I've ever seen my wife embarrassed of me is when we're biking and I shout back at people when we pass them. One time this happened though, where somebody was walking on the bike path, but they were walking their bike. <laughs> on the bike path, okay? And they don't see me coming, and I'm riding my bike, and I try to get around them, right? But then, as I'm about to get around them, they turn the bike, and now the bike is perpendicular to the bike path, taking up at least the whole right side of the lane, right? And I become that bad part of myself. I turn back to them, and I go, this is a bike path. And they go, I kid you not, that's why I've got my bike. <laughs> and I was like, that's not just a passport for the bike path. <laughs> It doesn't just grant you entrance to the bike path all of a sudden. You have to actually be riding your bike. That's why I think if I were a politician, that'd probably be the first, first thing I make illegal, right? I put hall monitors all up on the bike paths, you know? They wouldn't be able to arrest you for anything 
other than walking on the bike path. <laughs> you could be doing drugs right in front of them. They'd be like, that's fine. I'm just trying to make sure people stop walking here, <laughs> you know? That'd be my first tenant. I think if I was a politician, probably the second one would be that you, like they do in European countries where you have to pass on the left side, and if you get passed on the right side, you get the ticket on the highway, right? Does that make sense? Just because you own a Tesla or a pickup truck does not mean that you get to stay in the left lane without passing other people, right? Do we all, are we all aware of that, right? Because the left lane is not the faster than the speed limit lane. It's the faster than the other car's lane, right? Regardless of what people are going, which is actually a bad timing for me to tell this joke because I got my first speeding ticket last week, okay, which is a whole nother story. <laughs> but that actually did happen. And I think third political thing is ranked choice voting. I think that's it. So that's it. Those are the three things, you know. You guys with me? I think the main thing I'm going to win them over for is the bike path. I think that's the main reason people are going to elect me. For sure. I, uh, I took German in high school. Anybody else take German in high school? Just me and that person. V Gate to scene in? I'm just kidding. Imagine if I did the whole rest of the set in German. That'd be wild. I, uh, when I was in my senior year, my German class, okay, we were reading a book on the Holocaust in this German class, my senior year, okay, and the word for circumcision came up, and we translated it into English, and a kid in my class, I kid you not, goes, I can't believe they used to do that back then. <laughs> And we were all like, what, what, what do you mean by that? I was making eye contact with my teacher, looking at all the other classmates and we were like, okay, before I follow you under idiot, like, what do you mean by that, you know? And he goes, it just seems like such a barbaric thing to do. And we were like, okay, sure. But you know, it's like a pretty common medical practice even in America today, right? It's not just on the eighth day on top of Mount Sinai anymore, you know? Like we do this today. And he's like super shocked. He goes, what, are you serious? And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be honest with you. <laughs> Have a little heart to heart right here. Tell you something personal about myself. Even I, I'm circumcised. <laughs> And he's incredibly shocked, okay? He stands up out of his chair, jaw dropped like he just saw a deer pick up a gun and shoot a human, okay? He's super shocked right now. And he looks at me dead in the eyes and he goes, what? You don't have any testicles? <laughs> he got circumcision mixed up with castration, okay? I laughed for at least 20 minutes, okay? With my whole class at that kid who also ended up going to Purdue, which is a bummer, okay? <laughs> for all of us. All my classmates are like, you? <laughs> what are they doing at Purdue, you know? <laughs> but I know I say stupid stuff in high school too. I, I worked at a Chick-fil-A in high school for a while. That was my summer job. I worked at a Chick-fil-A in high school. Um, I know I, I, I was a tall cow. I was, I was wearing the cow suit. Um, but it was fun. It was utterly fun. And I know I've got RBF, uh, resting Baptist face, but uh, I started turning words into verbs a lot when I was working at Chick-fil-A. I'd be like, hey, can you chicken me? Meaning, can you give me that chicken, right? I'd be like, hey, can you pen me? Meaning, can you give me that pen? Well, that all stopped one day when I accidentally asked for a milk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you don't get where the joke is going, milk is already a verb, okay? With a specific meaning in the farming communities in central Indiana, okay? Yeah, and I wasn't even wearing the cow suit at that point, okay? And I, I yelled. I yelled loud like Gandalf tongue the ball rock that he shall not pass, okay? I said, hey, Jenny. Now this was my boss. This was a female. This was a woman of the Lord, okay? I yelled, hey, Jenny, can you milk me? I said that in the Castleton Mall food court, okay? In front of hundreds of men, women, and children, okay? The look on every paying customer's face was a mix of both intrigue and mortification. <laughs> intrigue, because they wanted to keep watching to see what was gonna happen, right? And mortification, because it was a pretty family-friendly place, you know, right? Like, there's a lot of children present. That was probably the least family-friendly I've ever been in my life, you know? The only time that was worse was when I asked for a spoon. <laughs> That's when they fired me. That's when they fired me. The funniest part to me is I never milked anything in my entire life. I've never taken an... I've never, I've never milked anything in my entire life, you know? <laughs> Except maybe this joke, am I right? <laughs> I've got like three more milk puns. I'm not even gonna do them. I'm just gonna skim right past them. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I had to. Do you guys think the KKK can drink milk? Because I know they're intolerant, but... <laughs> but are they lactose intolerant? 
I love the pause and laughter when I say the word KKK. It's funny. The air gets sucked out of the room. They're like, oh, it's just another milk pun. <laughs> are you guys aware of that pickup line? Are you from Tennessee? Because you're the only 10 I see. Do you guys know that pickup line, right? So, okay, man, the people who didn't know that are going to love the rest of this bit. But... <laughs> I wrote a bunch of other pickup lines based on other states, okay? And I was wondering if I could just try them out on you guys and you let me know what you think, okay? I think we should add to, are you from Tennessee? Because you're the only 10 I see. I think we should add to that. Are you from Alaska? Because I'm thinking I'll ask you out. Right, that one's kind of sweet. I don't know why it's not already in our public lexicon already, right? Um, but that's probably the only sweet one. Um, next to these is, are you from Texas? Because I'm thinking later I can text this. That one's mostly the finger guns, to be honest. <laughs> That's really the main part of that one is the finger guns that come out. Um, but bear with me, because they do get significantly weirder from here, okay? Uh, next to these is, are you from Kentucky? Because uh, I'm thinking later I can Kentucky you in. <laughs> Guys, that's good. I remember when I was single, that would have gotten me. I feel like, right? <laughs> Next to these, uh, are you from Georgia? Because if George were a verb, I'd Georgia. <laughs> is it dirty? I don't know. You guys, it is if you thought it was, but it's not if you didn't, you know? It's a little choose your own adventure, that one. Uh, next is, are you from Hawaii? Because I can see the look on your face going, how, why, we? <laughs> And then last, of course, is, are you from Idaho? That one's obvious. That one's obvious. You guys fill it in yourself. You guys fill that one in yourself. But I've actually now got three pickup lines based on countries. You thought I was done, but I'm not, okay? This is now three pickup lines based on countries. It's worth it, I promise, okay? This first one is, are you from China? Because I'm trying to ask you out. Right? It's probably good. Pretty good. I feel like it'd work on about 1.5 billion people or so. <laughs> Next to these, of course, is, are you from Namibia? Because I can see the look on your face going, no, nah, maybe, yeah. <laughs> it's like the Hawaii one, I get it, I get it. Uh, and last of these, of course, is, are you from Georgia? Because if George were a verb, I'd Georgia. <laughs> it's a country and a state, you guys, okay? Part of the former USSR. Get a map, learn some culture, okay? Thank you all so much. I really just do that entire, like, two and a half minutes just so I can do the Georgia one twice. It's... <laughs> I'm that proud of saying the same joke twice. <laughs> I love it. I recently found out I didn't know what teething is. You guys know what teething is? It's just when a baby's teeth start growing. That's all it means. I don't know why, though, that for most of my life, I was under the impression that teething was when a baby bites during breastfeeding. No idea why I believe that, okay? <laughs> but for some reason, for decades, I had it logged up here as the definition of the word teething. <laughs> but it explains why I've been entirely, overly sympathetic to nursing mothers my whole life. <laughs> Whenever they tell me that their baby is teething, <laughs> because my actual genuine response for years was something along the lines of, oh my goodness, I am so sorry. <laughs> And they'd always look at me weird, but I didn't quite get why. <laughs> they'd be like, my baby's teething. I'm not getting any sleep. I'd be like, how are those ideas connected? You know? <laughs> I'd be like, my baby's teething. And somebody else would be like, ooh, how many teeth does it have? I'm like, that shouldn't matter. That's insensitive, okay? <laughs> that would hurt no matter what. <laughs> I found it out because my sister-in-law told me that my nephew was teething. And my actual response was, I was like, wow, Emily. Thank you for being so vulnerable. <laughs> and she looked at me and she was like, what in the world do you think I just told you? <laughs> and I was like, isn't it when a baby... Okay, if you're gonna make me say it, I'll say it. Uh, isn't it when a baby, you know, bites you while you feed it? She was like, no, that's not what it is at all. And she explained it to me and I was like, that's why people have been looking at me weird this whole time. I thought I was being the nice guy. It turns out I was being the creep, you know? <laughs> I thought I was being empathetic. It turns out I had my head in the wrong place that entire time. I, uh, I'm in therapy. I think somebody else already asked. There, are you guys in therapy? Any therapy? Yeah. Okay. I feel like more of you should be. Um, <laughs> I know Indiana. No, I'm just kidding. I, um, I'm in therapy, but my, I tell my therapist that my main goal for mental health is I just want to have the mental health of M. Night Shyamalan. Does that resonate with anybody? I just want to be able to make anything and be like, this doesn't even need to be good, you know? <laughs> Man, what bravery that guy must have. What mental resilience. To be able to make any movie and be like, I don't even got to stick the ending, you know? 
<laughs> like in two years, I'll get full funding for another movie. <laughs> it doesn't matter, man. He's like the one person I feel like that doesn't have imposter syndrome, but he's also like the one person I'm like, you should have <laughs> a little bit of imposter syndrome <laughs> at this point. You know, bravery, resilience. I feel like Brene Brown should write a book on him. You know, that's how it feels. <laughs> Brene Brown's too deep of a cut, I get it. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I love Air Bud. You guys like Air Bud? Freaking love Air Bud. We had such a string of movies in the 90s where it just didn't need to make sense at all, you know? If you don't know, Air Bud is a movie about a dog on a high school basketball team. And it's a pretty good time, okay? And it's such a good time, they made like nine sequels, y'all, okay? One for every other sport. I'm pretty sure there's an Air Bud lacrosse, right? <laughs> it's ESPN 3, but it's Air Bud 9. <laughs> If you haven't seen Air Buddies, it's an entire litter of puppies playing soccer. It's an adorable film. You should check it out. You're going to have a good Friday night in the sequel. They go to space, okay? <laughs> My favorite part of the original Air Bud movie is uh, a part you probably remember. It's the most famous part of the movie, right? It's about halfway through the movie. They start asking themselves this question that they should have asked themselves at the beginning of the movie, which is this question. Is a dog allowed to play on this high school basketball team? <laughs> Okay, they're four games into the season, I kid you not. <laughs> and for the first time, the referee is like, I should look this one up, okay? And he starts flipping through the rule book and the camera zooms in and the music swells cinematically. And he looks up from the rule book and he goes, I don't know, there's nothing in the rules that says a dog can't play basketball. It's like, I don't think you need that rule. The dog doesn't go to that high school. <laughs> is that not the more important rule in that rule book? How is Arabut on varsity? He doesn't have above a C average. What is going on right now? That would not have flown in my high school, you know? What a world we'd be in if every rule book needed to be just a little bit longer to have a no dog rule. No, just to clarify, no dogs can operate this heavy machinery. That'd be wild. You don't want your flight attendant running down the aisle being like, wait, I don't know, there's nothing in the rules that says a dog can't fly this airplane. <laughs> It's like, yeah, I don't think the FAA needed that rule. I don't know. I don't think Airbud has logged his 10,000 hours. I think, I think that's the more important reason Airbud's not flying Spirit right now, you know? Even Spirit doesn't want Airbud, okay? But it's even tougher for Airbud, you know, because it'd be like 70,000 hours. <laughs> that's the best joke I've ever written in my life. It's, that's it, I've peaked at that. That's the best joke. You're never gonna, yeah, that's it. I'm here and I'm telling Airbud jokes, that's it. I uh, also love High School Musical. You guys like High School Musical? Any HSM fans out there? I love High School Musical. I think High School Musical is probably my favorite trilogy. I just like calling it a trilogy. I think that's fun, you know? It's like, what's your favorite trilogy? Lord of the Rings, High School Musical. <laughs> Similarly epic, you know? I think High School Musical is really good. I think if we made High School Musical and we put it on Broadway and it never was on Disney Channel, I think we'd be like, wow, this is like really deep, you know? It'd be like mature art, you know? We'd think of it like we do with Hamilton or Dear Evan Hansen, like really like deep, mature art. It'd be like bop, 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 bop to the top. People would be like, wow. <laughs> What a metaphor for the struggling artist, you know? <laughs> We'd be like, we're all in this together. It's like, wow, community engagement. That's so sweet. <laughs> Kids, we're spending 600 bucks. We're going to Broadway to watch High School Musical. There'd be some rich banker up in the second mezzanine on Broadway. He'd get done with High School Musical. He'd call his wife. He'd be like, honey, I'm quitting that job at Wells Fargo. I got to get my, get my, get my head in the game of this marriage. And he hangs up the phone. <laughs> You're probably thinking I'm done with High School Musical material, but I'm not. I, I, my favorite deep dive into High School Musical is the first song of High School Musical, okay, right? It's called The Start of Something New. It's where our Starcraft lovers meet for the first time at the beginning of the movie at a ski lodge, right? And they're singing a karaoke song called The Start of Something New. This is where I think it's fun, though, right? We know it as The Start of Something New from High School Musical, but they sing it in that scene as a karaoke song, which implies that to the people around them, that song already exists exists and is wildly popular enough to be on a karaoke and enough to people sing along, which means that the high school musical universe, which is a clearly separate universe from our own, is one where the song, the start of something new, already exists. And that's fun to me, right? Because I'm just thinking, who made the song in their universe, right? Was it another musical that they all know about, that they're all singing? Was it Jason Derulo? You know, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Okay, last movie I like to talk about is Parasite. You guys seen Parasite? 
Yeah. Best Picture winner from a couple years ago. Great movie. You don't have to have seen the movie to get the joke. Don't check out, okay? All you need to know to get the joke is that about halfway through the movie, the tone of Parasite shifts very significantly, right? And it goes from being kind of lighthearted and a comedy to darker and more of a thriller. That's all I'm going to say, right? If that doesn't whet your appetite, I don't know what will. But <laughs> I was telling a friend of mine about this, and I was like, yeah, it's a great movie. But halfway through the movie, the tone shifts. It's very dark. It's very tense. And for the second half of the movie, your butthole is just going to be tight. <laughs> for the rest of the movie, because that's how tense of a movie it is, right? If you've seen it, you know what I mean. And my friend looked at me and he goes, what? My butthole's gonna be tight for half a movie? I don't want my glutes to be sore the next day. And I'm like, wait a second, let's pump the brakes on the movie discussion. Do you think your butthole's the same thing as your glutes? <laughs> Is that what we just figured out in this friendship right here? You know when your butthole tightens, you think that's the same thing as your glutes flexing? Like, do you think that when you're like your sphincter puckers, you think that's like the same thing as like your glutes flexing? Cause it's like a different muscle group down there, right? You know what I mean? It's like a different, it's like a different, it's like a different, right? Are you guys trying it? Are you guys trying it? Who tied their butthole? Who tied their butthole, yeah? I know, I know a lot of you. I lose eye contact with the front row during that joke. I always do. It goes from like, that's a good point to, they look above me during that joke a little bit. I love that joke. I just made at least half of you guys tighten your butthole. I know I did. That's a good time right there. People are going to be like, how was that? How was that show at the White Rabbit? You're going to be like, you will not believe what the last comic got me to do. I tightened my butthole with a bunch of strangers. And I loved it. I had a good time. I had no idea that was a group activity, you know? Because usually when you tighten your butthole, it's an accident, but you just chose. That's beautiful, right? You, you, your consciousness descended and chose to tighten your butthole. That's beautiful, right? It's more beautiful in life when you choose to do things, right? Will, determination, tightening your butthole, right? That's, that's what life's about. Because when was the last time you tightened your butthole? It was probably involuntary. It was probably like, oh, grandma was racist again, or something like that, right? But you just did it on purpose. That's cool, guys. Take that back to the water cooler, okay? Talk about it this week at work. I think that's cool. I think it is. Okay, we're coming to the end. I'm going to end on some impressions. You guys like impressions? Yeah? Okay, well, whatever that idea of impressions is, just throw it out the door, okay? And let's get on board for what I'm actually about to do. Okay, so the first impression, this is my impression of Clifford the Big Red Dog facing charges of cannibalism. <laughs> it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. That was the whole thing, so let's get on board, okay? <laughs> I got like six more of these. It'll be more fun for you, I promise you, if you get on board, okay? Uh, this next one, this is my impression of my Latino friend uh, saying hello to the king of the Greek gods. Hey, Zeus. Thank you guys. Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, this next one, uh, this is my impression of a recovering yet struggling alcoholic who goes to a Southern Baptist church for the first time, okay? A recovering yet struggling alcoholic who goes to a specifically Southern Baptist church for the first time. This is grape juice? <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was the whole thing. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you a question for this moment, okay? Slight per crowd participation. This next impression, this is my impression of a bartender who doesn't understand what a mocktail is. You guys know what a mocktail is, right? It's like a cocktail without alcohol, okay? So this is my impression of a bartender who doesn't know what a mocktail is. Hey, what can I get for you? Tell me a drink. Margarita. A margarita? That's me mocking her. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Okay, a couple more, a couple more. Uh, this next impression, uh, this is my impression of somebody who moved from the Mexican state of Oaxaca in southern Mexico, okay? So he moved from Oaxaca, like Oaxacan food, okay? So he moved from Oaxaca to New York City, okay? Oaxaca to New York City. Hey, I'm Oaxacan here! <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you so much. You'll never see something like that again, I promise you. <laughs> This next impression, this is my impression of a really scared hot dog, okay? This is my impression of a scared hot dog. A contest? <laughs> Thank you guys so much. 
And my last impression, and I will get out of here on this, guys. Uh, this is my impression of a comedian who moves from Indiana to Los Angeles to pursue his dreams, but is nervous that his parents are disappointed in him. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I've been Jared Kastenbaum. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching my first special, The Better Jared. If you enjoyed the special, please consider sharing it on whatever social media people respect your opinion on. And if you really enjoyed the special, check out my Patreon, where I get bonus content, behind the scenes, extra stand-up, a monthly vlog. Check it out, there's multiple tiers. And of course, on this YouTube channel, please like it and subscribe. Thank you again, and please enjoy having a better Jared for you to tell your friends about.